the Spaniards hear word of a great empire, a massive culture and civilization that's existing deeper inland. It's not just a great empire, but it is an empire that is oppressive. And these people live in fear of this all powerful kind of empire and it's unchallenged in its might and its, and its strength. And so this sparks the imagination, the sense of adventure for many Spaniards. One of them, of course, being a, a lower noble by the name of Hernan Cortes. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Pinedo Brothers podcast. I'm your host, Peter, and I have with me my brother, JP. Hey, I'm JP. JP's in the house, and welcome back. We are the Pinedo Brothers. We are our filmmaking brothers working to revitalize the world of Catholic art through stories about faith, not faith films. So that means dynamic storytelling, storytelling that engages the hearts, the minds, and the imaginations of uh, our viewers, our listeners, our whatever medium that we're communicating through. So thank you very much for joining us, and we're glad to have you here. Today we're telling uh, the story and also discussing the story of one of the uh, probably most compelling uh, periods of history, and that is the American uh, colonization by the Europeans, the Spanish, the Spaniards, the British, the Portuguese, all of these different European nations coming over to the Americas. And um, specifically, we're talking about Cortez and the conquest of Mexico which of course, I think we've touched on it a little bit here and there in our past podcast. But this, of course, is a story that's near and dear to, well, me and JP especially, but also any, really any Texan, because we're so heavily influenced by Mexican culture and Mexican um, history. Um, so without further ado, I say, let's get started. Let's hop on right into it. Yeah. yeah any questions, comments, concerns, JP? Well, as a way of introducing this topic, can you say a little bit more about why we chose it? You said it's because, you know, Mexican culture is so, looms so large in our lives, but can you say more about why this is so important to us? Well, I think that it's pretty safe to say that at this point in our culture, we are having, we're having um, a lot of self-loathing for Western colonization, a lot of loathing for uh, institutions like Christianity and cultural movements like Christianity. And these are things that are very vital and formative to our culture. So, <clears throat> so it's important, I think, that we examine them and see and look at them objectively for what they bring to culture and what they bring to society, what they've done in the past and what they are doing to us now. Um, and so the conquest of Mexico which um, was a very bloody, brutal affair um, and a lot of bloodshed going on on both sides. Um, but I think it's important to look at it for what it was, you know, to not sugarcoat anything and to examine and kind of discuss, like, is this, was the conquest of Mexico ultimately something that was for the better for us as a culture, as modern Americans? Um, or is it something that did a lot of damage uh, that is that was ultimately would have been better without. I think that if you look at the the cultural elites for um, especially Mexico, if you go there, um, the the currents are right there are very anti Western, very anti Spaniard, um, which is weird because you know as Mexicans we you know have a lot of uh, pride for the Spanish language and our and our culture, which is a very mestizo kind of culture. Uh, mestizo being that, that mix of the Native American and that Spaniard blood, uh, mixing together to form something new, the, the Mexican people. Um, but right now, I think that the, the kind of cultural elite kind of, uh, cool thing to think is that it was that, that Spaniard, Spanish colonization is something inherently evil. Um, so I want to be able to, to take a step back and look at it and see, is it something that's inherently evil? And what if, if so, like, you know, why would it be evil? What, what did it do? What happened? And let's, you know, I think it's important for people to understand um, kind of 
to try to, to think outside the box about what's happened in the past and look at, and look at things objectively. We don't do enough of that these days. Yeah, and I think something beyond being objective, if I'm going to add my, my slice of this pie, throw that into the mix, I think that um, I could err upon the side of not being very grateful for this culture that we've um, inherited from so many people, so many, some of them not so good people and some of them amazing, heroic, virtuous people. And I think that's, I'm not alone in that. I am not grateful from time to time. And I see an incredible tendency for our modern day young people to be not grateful for the great Western culture that we have inherited. And I think if we understand better what happened and what it is we inherited and how we came to inherit it, we'll be more grateful for it because it's pretty cool. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, with that, with that, let's, let's say get into it. I want to talk about it. Uh, this, it. Is a, this is a, this is a set the yeah, stage, like, Peter. Yeah. So let's, let's, let's go back, go back into our time machine and talk about, uh, think about what happened. Um, of course, this is very early kind of period of colonization. I think that Mexico, if I'm not mistaken, was one of the first like real chunks out of the mainland that, that uh, the Spaniards or any Europeans took out of American, uh, out of the Americas. Um, so it wasn't too long ago. It was in 1492, of course, that Columbus found the, ocean the new world <laughs> and found the new world. And he landed, of course, in the Caribbean. And, and it was a series of islands that were being discovered. And then suddenly the Spaniards find this huge, huge landmass that they are not sure how long or how far it goes. And it's bigger than anything they've, they've found before. And so this, um, and in here they interact with, uh, with new peoples there. And very quickly, um, the Spaniards find or hear, hear word of a great empire, a massive culture and civilization that's existing further, uh, deeper inland. And I think that very quickly they, they uh, catch wind of that it's not just a great empire, but it is an empire that is oppressive. It is terrorizing the peoples of, um, of the coastlands and, it's, and these people live in fear of this all-powerful kind of empire and it's unchallenged and it's might and it's might and it's, and it's strength. Um, and so this sparks the imagination and, and I think the sense of adventure for many Spaniards. Uh, one of them, of course, being a, a lower noble by the name of Hernan Cortez. And, uh, this, this guy, um, decides he's going to take an expedition and, and find this empire and, and find out what's going on over here and deeper inside the mainland. Uh, and so this is kind of an unprecedented, this is like pioneer of pioneers, you know, someone who's going out deep into the jungles of Mexico and completely on uh, heretofore uncharted territory. Um, and there with just a few um, hundred men, and I don't know, uh, I don't know the exact number. I'm not recalling it at the moment. Do you have it? Do you, are you able to, to tell me how many Spaniards you brought with him? I thought it was something like 324, but don't quote me on that. Yeah, yeah have- it was definitely in the low, like hundreds. Yeah. They had uh, just a few horses and they all died like pretty soon after hitting land and they had zero cannons and I think they had just a handful of muskets. Mm -hmm. So if people look back and say, well, they just had superior firepower. Well, maybe they had better swords, but by firepower, that was better swords, you know, so. So, yeah, if nothing else, these men were definitely brave. (laughs) going into the unknown with uh, virtually no resources, no supply chains, uh, no and hardly any uh, equipment or weaponry uh, and seeking a great empire. And so they go in, they're guided by- Can you imagine that? Like (laughs) there's 300 of us, there's this great empire we've heard about 
And they were, they were not going on a fact-finding mission. They weren't going in just to be like, let's see who we find out. They kind of knew they were going to go fight. This was their mm. expectations. You know, these guys were fighters. But can you imagine that? 300 guys, like, no, like, secret weapon or anything like that beyond their confidence in themselves. The finest fighters in the world is what the Spanish were at the time because they had spent how many centuries? Probably five centuries fighting off invading hordes of Muslims who were like almost wiped the Spaniards off the face of the map completely. So the Spanish had spent centuries fighting for survival. And now they're like, okay, well, let's go see what else there is to fight. Really? <laughs> these fighters were like that. And maybe that's not mm -hmm. so very noble of a cause. Sure. <laughs> the, the more noble ones were coming later and they're known as the Franciscans. And then mm -hmm. after that, the Jesuits, those are the ones that we'll know about who are the peaceful people. But even if you're just looking at it from a purely just practical standpoint, not looking at ju uh, judging morals, that's pretty incredible. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Now, this is what I think they would they probably term in the army what we call audacious. <laughs> 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 that's one of the principles of, of um, uh, assaults and aggression is that you got to be audacious. And I think that... <laughs> The Spaniards, uh, uh, the, they really, uh, they fit that bill right there. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Um, so they're audaciously going in to mainland, uh, the most, the most inner, uh, deeper into the, into the land that they've ever been and, and completely and, and just going into the unknown. Um, but they, they're not without help. They have, uh, various guides from the Native American, uh, nations and tribes. Um, who they befriend and who are guiding them through uh, deeper into the mainland. And finally, um, the, this great empire uh, catches wind of these strange men who came aboard, like basically what they perceive as some kind of magical um, uh, ship, you know, that was sailing through the oceans. They had no concept of a ship that the size that the Spaniards were using. Um, and so they're very naturally very curious, like what's going on? Who are these, you know, new, strange looking people? Um, which of course is also a really fascinating thing to kind of imagine from the Native American perspective. Like they, they legitimately thought that they were seeing like, uh, what are those called where they're half men, half horses, those things? Centaur. Yeah, because they had never like seen horses before and then let alone uh, men completely covered in iron riding on a horse before. So that is, was quite the sight to them, for them to see. And they had no understanding of it. They thought it was some kind of half man, half, you know, beast kind of chimera going on. Um, so naturally they're very curious. What's Real that? quickly, how, how is it? Maybe that's, is that how they convinced? How, is that how they befriended these tribes? Like that seems to be almost incredible that they can just land and then befriend these tribes to help guide them. Do you know how that came to be? Well, I mean, there's, of course, there's no ever like any solid answer in history, but from the most likely thing that we, we can kind of pick up on from my knowledge is that there was this great fear and this hatred for the Aztecs. And that's the great empire where we've been referring to the Aztec empire which uh, existed in Mexico City, which existed back then before, you know, pre-Columbian Mexico City. Um, there was a great um, fear and hatred for the, for the Aztecs because these Aztecs were oppressive. They were um, kidnapping uh, tribes along the coastline and using them for their human sacrifice in the, in the hundreds and the thousands. Um, and so I think that many of these Native Americans saw these strange men who were half horse, half, you know, half, horse, half beast, half uh, man coming. And they saw it as, a, as an opportunity, uh, maybe a chance of maybe using them and kind of uh, ha maybe they had some sparks of hope that they might be, over, be able to finally overthrow their, their Aztec, human sacrificing Aztec overlords. So yeah. I think... That's kind of a big part of it, why they were able to, to make friends so quickly. <laughs> there yeah. was a need, a demand. Yeah, I, I, could, I could see that. And then I think 
correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm not sure about this scholarship. I think there were prophecies that there would be people coming from beyond the sea that would mm -hmm. overthrow these, these slavers, which the Aztecs were. They were slaves. They, they enslaved hundreds, hundreds of tribes that were inferior in might to them in the surrounding areas and were using them to fuel their, their human sacrifice machine. So if you have that going on and there's a prophecy that someone's going to come and save you from this, then you might be more at, like more prone when you see these people coming from across the sea saying, I'm going to help these people, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I know that there were definitely uh, prophecies going on about something like that happening. I don't know how uh, prevalent it was in the, in the and coastland tribes. tribes. Yeah. I know it was definitely something, a prophecy that was uh, very prevalent amongst the Aztecs. And I know that was one of the reasons that the, uh, the emperor at the time of Cortez's landing, Montezuma, um, was very curious about because he knew about those prophecies of that his empire would someday be overthrown by some um, godlike kind of power from, from across the sea. Um, so naturally something they were, they were very curious about. Um, and so the first interactions they had, you know, weren't, weren't, uh, very aggressive. They were more kind of exploratory. They were getting to, to meet each other and to see each other. Um, but, and, and initially even the Aztecs kind of, um, kind of let them into the city. Like, um, they basically, they had, they see, they saw it once they met these people, they were like, oh, okay, well, you know, they're very strange, but, <laughs> um, we are the mighty Aztecs and we are un unstoppable, undefeatable. And there, we have, we know, no, uh, no rival and no equal. And so basically they, they treated the Spaniards as, uh, country cousins, you know, like, uh, like, oh, hey, uh, you hillbillies, you know, basically the equivalent of like, oh, you uncultured. Uh, swine, basically, uh, we'll let you see our city, our, our great, um, great and powerful civilization. So they let them in. And the Spaniards, of course, are, are extremely uh, struck by what they see, because they've never seen anything in the Americas quite like near the scale of what was uh, pre Columbian Mexico City. Um, and you kind of it's a me pre Columbian Mexico City is a fascinating thing, because it was a city on a lake. Um, and <laughs> you go to Mexico City today, you will definitely see the aftermath of building of what what came afterwards because they they filled Mexico City, they filled that lake with uh, and filled it in with land and all you know different kinds of rubble and all that, and they built a city on top of a lake. And so now Mexico is sinking uh, terribly. Like <laughs> you go into the to the main cathedral uh, and. Uh, the main city center and it's like all lopsided and you're like falling over. Like you could literally just stand there and like roll over. Um, so it was built on a, on a lake and the city itself and uh, pre-Columbian Mexico city was a, a series of different, basically islands that were connected by bridges. Um, so it was extremely impressive. And then there was the great, uh, great pyramids um, and what, in which the Aztecs offered um human sacrifice in in the thousands they would have festivals where they would um they were renowned for ripping out the hearts so quickly and like their priests were so efficient at cutting out carving out the hearts and 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 you know x amount of seconds flat you know and then moving on to the next victim um and so the the spaniards were extremely impressed by the the scale and the grandeur of this empire but they were also horrified by the literal literal blood stained and blood soaked uh pyramids and streets on which the the bodies of the victims would just be let off to roll down and down the pyramid and down into the streets um so it was I both remember, uh what's that i remember reading an account of one of the it's a primary document so one of the spaniards was writing this and he was just recounting his first impression of seeing one of these temples and the Aztecs would at times make temples built out of the remains of their sacrifices. And so there could be entire edifices built out of skulls 
And I remember there was this one Spaniard who was doing the math about the amount of humans that had been sacrificed to, to make up these, this amount of skulls. And it's, you know, hundreds of thousands just to, just to build this building. Um, so, yeah, they were very efficient. They had to be. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and, you know, and, and they, weren't, they weren't dumb either. They weren't like some kind of um, stupid or gullible kind of, uh, I think oftentimes we have this uh, picture of the Native American tribes before the Europeans of being like these happy um, kind of gullible people who just like welcomed anyone in and were like, you know, were good neighbors basically. And were always, you know, giving, you know, giving of themselves and of their culture um, because they, they, they weren't dumb. They yeah, I find stupid. it really quite offensive when you think about it. Like they met what we, in our popular culture, we think we're doing Native Americans a favor by painting to be stupid people that rolled over at the first sign of any type of invader. They were warlike, and they were there was a reason why the Aztec Empire had no equal, like you said, and they hadn't had an equal in centuries. There's a reason why they're pretty good at what they do. They're pretty good at ruling. They're pretty good at subjugating. They're pretty good at defeating you on the battlefield. So mm -hmm. go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really true that they, they knew, they knew how, and they had the, the ability and the strength in order to build this a civilization on a magnitude that even the Spaniards were, uh, had not seen. Um, right. It, correct me if I'm wrong. I think Mexico city at the time of the Aztecs was larger than any Spanish city. Uh, probably any European city at all. Um, like there, there was no city the size of Mexico City. Uh, it was just for for the time something so massive and immense that it, it was just almost inc impossible for the Europeans to comprehend. Um, but it was equally impossible for them to comprehend the magnitude of the human sacrifice, which if uh, Hernan Cortez being um, you know an interesting figure, but in many ways, very deeply uh, Catholic, uh, found completely horrifying. Um, and I and think that's, that... What's that's that? an important thing for us to remember here. Um, I w you remember, Peter, I told you I was reading The Once and Future King by T.H. White. And he had a mm. great line in, I think, the first book of that, of that little uh, collection of books, in which he said, everyone was Catholic in those days, and they went to Mass every day, and they liked it. This is what the Spanish were. I love that way of putting it together is they weren't just Catholic. They actually liked being Catholic and mm -hmm. they took that seriously. It meant something to them, which is really something we can't understand right now. We understand people being devout Catholics, but it's hard for us to really picture an entire culture where you're Catholic and you like it. And that's a part of what your culture is, mm -hmm. especially us Americans. We can't quite get that. Maybe the Polish would understand it better, but mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it's 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 a big part of this story. Yeah, and I think it's. Uh, I mean, I, can, I will probably get into it in a second, but it's really interesting also to kind of look at that from a from a Mexican perspective too, because Mexico, of course, is still Catholic and it's deeply rooted in Catholic traditions and Catholic culture. But I don't really think that the average Mexican, um, at least living in the cities, is very proud of the fact that they're Catholic. I think that. Um, uh, there's kind of been a, a little bit of a lost, uh, heritage there, a loss of love for our heritage. Um, I think in many ways we're proud of parts about Catholicism because I don't think any Mexican is, I think, uh, I think you would be hard pressed to find a Mexican who doesn't love Our Lady of Guadalupe and who doesn't like aspects of Catholicism. But again, there's that that kind of self-loathing for our Western heritage and that, that side, that half of our, uh, of our heritage as mestizo people. Um, so anyway, we have um, the, these few hundred men, these uh, Europeans uh, under the leadership of Hernan Cortez, he, uh, they're in Mexico City and they're being shown around and uh, things start to deteriorate very quickly as I think suspicion grows between the two groups. Can you, are, are you, um, I'm drawing a little bit of a blank right now. Can you remind me of any of the, um, what was the cause or like what was going on between these two, um, 
as things started to deteriorate, I know that um, the two people started to become more suspicious of each other. And it all came to a head in one night. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, leading up to it, I'm not sure what brought it on, but the Spanish were basically barricaded in the building where they had been housed. Um, and there was a growing mob on the outside. And what they had done is they had, um, they had kidnapped the emperor of the Aztec empire and were hoping that that would diffuse the situation, that they would be able to use this emperor as like a bargaining chip to get out. Um, unfortunately, the mob that was growing outside, they might have liked their emperor, but they didn't like the emperor enough to stop <laughs> <laughs> to stop from killing these invaders. Yeah. Although I don't know what incited the mob going there to begin with. I used to at some point. Um, that's an important point. If we were telling the story, we would, uh, if we were telling the story with movies, we would, that would be an important point of intrigue. Right. Um, mm. I apologize. But so the mob killed the emperor and the span, like they just threw, they threw some projectile and the emperor died. And, um, the Spanish then had to contend with the angry mob now that their last bargaining chip had been taken away. Mm -hmm. And this is, uh, this is what brings us to what's known as El Noche Triste, the, the night of sorrow, in which um, I think uh, as a person, you know, uh, as one of these adventurers who has ventured this far into mainland America, farther than any European has ever been before, um, you felt you probably at this point thought that you had seen it all and that you had braved the horrors as much as you know you braved everything that this the scary world had to offer and if you believe that um you were you were sorely wrong. misled you were very wrong it could get a lot worse and the it's called the night of sorrows for a reason um because it was indeed probably one of the most horrifying harrowing experiences that any human could endure um, they're basically trapped in the middle of this, a city on the scale of which they have never seen or heard of before. And it's not just a city that you could run across the street in. It's a city of islands and you don't have any boats. And so you have to use bridges to get a city, you know, you have to use very specific bridges to get out, out of the city. And here you have a city, um, of, thousands and thousands of people who are intent on not only killing you, but brutalizing you in the most savage and barbaric kind of way imaginable. Like you had, well, you, you see the blood stains on the streets and you see the blood soaked pyramids and you know what they want to do with you. Yeah. Um, and that you actually, no I think out. works in, a little bit in their favor because they didn't just want to kill them on the battlefield. They wanted to overcome them alive so that they can be sacrificed alive. The gods demanded live sacrifices. So uh, maybe it would have been easier for the Aztecs if they were just out to kill them. But it was way worse for the Spaniards knowing that that's just, that's not it. They weren't going to have a warrior's death. They were going to be sacrificed to what the Spaniards thought of as the devil gods. Mm -hmm. Which, imagine that as a Catholic. That is terror that's terrorizing you know you're a true like a catholic that believes your faith and you're saying if i don't make it out of this city i'm not just going to die i'm going to die as a sacrifice to a demon sounds yeah. like the stakes are pretty high <laughs> yeah um but let's talk about let's just even just dwell on that for a second like i think that uh, as historians in the 21st century, you know, our modern kind of American culture, we really tend to, to, especially I think you see this in pop culture as well, like in movie depictions of people in the past, we really assume that nobody really believed what the culture said it believed, right? We, they, we see um, Spaniards and Spanish culture as very deeply Catholic, but I think our depictions of conquistadors and, and Spaniards is like, yeah, it's a cultural thing, but, you know, um, I don't, it's, you know, I, it's a very either agnostic or flat out just, you know, don't believe it. It's a skeptical yeah, of, of it all. We, 
we apply our postmodernistic tendencies to their very medieval mentality, which is completely backwards. It's bad history. It's bad history, yeah. And it's embarrassing on our part, I think, to, to always be imbuing these characters of the past, these people of the past, uh, with our own values and our own way of thinking. Like that is, it's a complete misunderstanding of how things happen. And I think if you have that view, you'll never really understand history or what happened before you. No, no not everyone thinks the way you do. And it's that, that applies for modern, uh, you know, just yeah. the, for your neighbor and uh, especially people who lived hundreds of years before you. It's a different, yeah. a completely different world. And so, like, it, I think that that further colors and that further uh, dramatizes this whole situation, right? When they, you know, as, a, as a person uh, of the Catholic faith who truly and deeply believes your Catholic faith, um, being sacrificed to a um, pagan god, to a, a demon god, no less, is something that's um, going to motivate you, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if nothing else. Um, and so... It, it, this, during this night of sorrows, these uh, few hundred Spaniards are getting um, chopped down. And, and you can picture it if you're just one of the foot soldiers trying desperately to get out. Um, and your friends and your companions that you've traveled across the world with are being brutalized and murdered on every side of you. And you're desperately trying to get out. And what they had, so they used a series of bridges um, to get out of Mexico City, but the, the Mexicans, um, not really Mexicans as we know them today, the, but the, um, they, well, they, it was, it was, they did call it Mexico before. So I guess you could see, see them as Mexicans, but they're definitely not what you would consider Mexicans today. Uh, so yeah, we'll definitely, we we'll, can call them Aztecs. We're, um, surrounding them and destroying the bridges as well. Um, and their fever to, to kill and sacrifice these people. And so your, your options are continually getting smaller for escape. Um, and it gets more and more desperate. Um, and so, and they also, so what the Aztecs would use was a little, uh, basically little canoes, little boats that they, they would use to, to travel across, you know, around the city. Um, but the Spaniards didn't have that. And so they're forced to, to find a, a bridges in a city where, where the bridges are all being destroyed. Um, but somehow, in some way, they, um, after undergoing this incredible night of torture and in which so many of them are killed and, and uh, sacrificed, um, they actually make it back to, um, to the shore, back uh, out of the lake and onto the and they regroup into one of the nearby villages with along with their uh, Native American allies. And, and this is a point where um, you can imagine just the horror and the despair that they must have been feeling after undergoing such an experience. Um, and so they decide to go back. <laughs> but just, just to like bef- put, a, put a pause there, just to pause there mm-hmm. when you go back. Let's picture you're in Mexico City the largest city you've ever seen. Like it's most people haven't seen a city, you know, most of these people are not city dwellers. They're, they're mostly, it's in a, Spain is an agrarian society, especially at that point. So they're seeing this city on a massive scale and everyone in the city wants to not just kill them, but sacrifice them to a, a demon God And you've managed to kidnap the emperor, maybe by sordid means, but you've managed to, and you're thinking, this is, we're going to use this guy as a ticket to get out of here. And then imagine the feeling right when that emperor, so they brought him out, someone strikes down the emperor with a projectile and he's dead. You're, and you're, let's say you drag him back inside this building that you're captured, that you're, you're boarded up in. And you're like, okay, now what? Just imagine that feeling as, as that, that you're realizing you have no way out. And so they just ride out and meet these people. They don't die. They don't get caught inside the building. They actually, the first step is actually leaving this place, this point of shelter. 
that is huge. And then finding a path, the, the pontoon bridges path that you spoke of to get out, the c- connecting the canoes and the bridges to get out of this, this massive city. Like in every point you're, tr- you're being besieged. There was one time where Cortez had been overcome and he was being dragged back to a temple. And one of Cortez's best friends sacrificed himself, you know, basically came in and knocked over everyone, got himself surrounded so that Cortez got a chance to get out. And, you know, Cortez's best friend didn't make it out. So it was, everyone was hard pressed and really everyone should have died. The fact that they weren't dead at the end of that night really is the miracle of the story and and the amazing part of this. And then, yeah, what you're saying is the regrouping part, the part that always, and I want to turn this over to you to ask you this, what is it that possibly could have convinced the Native American tribes that had helped them to begin with? You see very clearly that these, these Spaniards are human. They've just been destroyed, but thrown out of a city. Like they're lucky to be alive. They're clearly not equipped to win this battle. What is it that doesn't make these neighboring tribes turn them over to their Aztec overlords immediately? Like that always seems kind of amazing to me. Hmm. Well, I mean, uh, uh, that's a good question. The, the, The first question one would have to answer is, why didn't they just turn them in like uh, kind of as a an apologetic, like, oh, I'm so sorry, uh, Aztec overlords here, here are the, the, the Europeans, take them, uh, please have mercy on us. Um, and I think probably the answer to that is that they knew that um, the Aztecs would take them and then take them as well. <laughs> they would take the Europeans and then take them as well and sacrifice them all. Um, so I think that many of these Native uh, American tribes realized that the Aztec Empire was not a benevolent empire and not a merciful empire, and that they had they knew that they had been uh, crossed by these tribes and that there was basically no going back at that point. But of course, um, most of at, at, after the Noche Triste, most of the um, the Native American tribes did actually um, go back. They did give up and they left and they abandoned the the Spaniards and went back home. And basically, I think their mindset was like, all right, we're going to go ahead and fortify and uh, fortify our villages and see if we can try to weather this, sit this one out and weather the storm, uh, the vengeance that we knew know was going to be coming. But not all of them did leave. Some of them did stay. And I think that was uh, very um, impressive on their part to have the, the um, I guess, I don't know what I would describe it as, but to just have the, the fortitude to stick through that with the Spaniards. Um, I know, I think it was Texacoco, which was the city just on the mainland that was on the other side of the lake from Mexico City, uh, was probably one of the the Cortez's biggest allies who uh, stuck it through and they kept their warriors with uh, the Spaniards. And from there, uh, Cortez, basically, he, he plans a, a counterattack. He's going, he's going to go back Let's and go he's going to launch an invasion. He's like, all right, guys. <laughs> well, that tells you, I really, that tells you something. It tells you these were not ordinary men. And the only people that would be willing to stay with these clearly not ordinary men would be just as extraordinary as these Spaniards. So I think it tells you a lot about the Texacocan warriors as well as the Spaniards that A, the Texacocan warriors gave them a place to regroup and maybe some of the other surrounding tribes. So they were able to regroup, but then they both went on counterattacks along with their other allies. It, it shows there's that level of fortitude is something we really don't see anymore, mm-hmm. at least in our daily life. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, these are what you call true men of grit. Like <laughs> it takes some kind of um, 
some kind of grit to be able to go through something like that and be like, all right, you know, I'm not actually going to be leaping. I'm going to turn around, right around and I'm going to fight to the death. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to say exactly um, what drove that and what kind of uh, spurred on that kind of courage. But I think it is definitely safe to say that they're, yeah, they're not ordinary uh, men and they, these are, are truly audacious men. And I can are, say one thing. You say it's, it's hard to, to, to quantify what it is. I can tell mm-hmm. you something it's not. We're often cast, or, or the, the conquistadors are often cast as purely being motivated by greed or mostly motivated by greed. Greed would not be enough to make you go back. Mm. After a night like that, greed is not enough. So rule that one right. out. Yeah. No, I think that's definitely, and that's, that's something really more uh, cultural um, historians and more, more cultural scholars should really pay attention to is that the, the European invasion of uh, Mexico, it, it definitely, at least at this point, was not motivated by a greed or a want for gold or resources that they were going to get from Mexico. Um, because n- nothing, um, no like greed, like you were saying, could motivate you to, to go back after enduring the horror of that night. Um, and I think it's also, in, it, it is an interesting detail to, to point out that yeah, we have, I think we, we all know the story of what happened after the Spaniards won and how uh, the Mexico City was, was Europeanized and, um, and how all of Mexico became a Spanish colony. And, and we know about the abuses that happened after that. Um, but I think it's an important thing to remember and to point out is that if Cortes and the Spaniards had left, um, we probably would, you know, would probably see a reign of terror, like, un, you know, of unknown proportions, uh, just out of the Aztecs' pure sense of revenge. Because like I was saying, they're not a merciful empire. And here you had basically all the other tribes turning on them in a hopes that the Europeans could lead them to victory. Um, and the Europeans are decimated and cast out of the city. And so um, what was coming was a reign of terror from the Aztecs. They would have enslaved on an even greater scale. I'm, I am willing to wager that they would have enslaved more on a greater scale and more sacrificed than ever before to terrorize these tribes back into submission. Um, and so, you know, maybe the, the, year, the Spaniards didn't do this out of, out of a sense of loyalty or duty to the, to the Native Americans, but that was definitely kind of one of the results of yeah. them going back and not giving up the mission because they could, have, they could have escaped, um, but the Native American tribes and all of the, the people, you know, the women and children and, and men and warriors of those tribes could not have escaped. They, they didn't have a uh, culture that they could run back to. That was their home, and they they were about to be just completely decimated by the Aztecs just because of revenge. Yeah, yeah. Well, two things that come to me when you say that, and the first thing is no insult upon you or any other military man, but really just a, a sad statement of fact of the bureaucrats who run our military. If it had been Americans that were in this position, yeah, we would have left. Just look what happened in Afghanistan. We left them all, everyone to die, all our allies. We would have left and the Aztecs would have had their way just like you said. Second thing, if, we, if the, the Spanish had left, suppose they had been like Americans and left, then we would probably not have a mestizo culture at all. There would be none of our complexion in America because probably what happens, the Portuguese are not capable of defeating the Aztecs. So the Spanish should run tail and don't defeat the Spanish. What's going to happen is the English are gonna, or if the Spanish don't defeat the Aztecs, the English are going to. The English are very, 
you know, not far behind as far as war, warcraft's capabilities. And they would have figured out a way, just like they figured out a way in North America. And the English do not mix. So there would be no culture that we have now if the Spanish had turned tail. There would have been massive, massive revenge on a, in, in a tragic scale. And then the English would have come in and probably found a way because the English are really good and had way more resources than the Spanish. Um, and there would be no mestizo culture. Yeah, I mean, it's, you would see a completely different world. And um, I don't know if we, we properly explained earlier what mestizo culture is. Um, but this is something that you, you know, fast forwarding uh, a little while after the conquest of Mexico by Cortez, um, how um, there is this fusion of the Spanish culture and identity with Native American Mexican uh, culture. And this forms uh, a new people. And I think that the founding principle and founding uh, a motivator behind this, this flourishing of this culture is Our Lady of Guadalupe and how she appears to a, um, a poor Native American, Juan Diego, who is a, um, a Native American who converted to Christianity wholeheartedly, not, not out of any compulsion or sense of uh, duress, but out of an authentic love for what he found in Christianity. And this simple, uh, this simple poor man has the mother of God from the, uh, the culture of the across, from across the sea who, you know, some Spaniards might look down on the Native Americans or some, or there was definitely, I think, a perception in, in some of the Native Americans that this was some, this Christianity was something that was not of them. It was uh, something from across the sea. It was these other Spaniards. It was their thing and, and it had nothing to do with them. But you have this most simple of all um, Native Americans, someone who had no political power and who was poor, had the mother of God from this, this other culture appear to him and talk to him and converse with him. And not just do that, but also appear to him as one of, a, one of, one who looks like him. Um, but not just like him, but also a, a mix of the Spaniards and of the Native Americans as someone who is mestizo. Um, and so this, I think, goes on to found, be, to, to um, form Mexican culture and to form the hearts and minds of the Mexican people because it is something completely and wholly theirs um, and something that, that shows them that Christianity is theirs and it is something that, that uh, uh, God does not disdain them and does not uh, see them as less than. Um, and so it's a, it's a beautiful thing. And I think it's something that we can all reflect on and kind of appreciate as, uh, not just as Mexicans as, or as native, as Latin Americans, but also just as, as humans, how, um, we, how the, how God does not disdain to see us, uh, to see himself as one of us. It's really beautiful. Um, but I get in ahead of myself. <laughs> we still have, uh, Cortez um, pulled up in Texacoco and planning a, a, to launch a, a counterattack. And he plans what is, you know, I, I actually, actually did study the, um, his uh, tactics that he used to take back or to take Mexico City. Awesome. Um, the city center, which was called Tenochtitlan. Um, and I, I actually did a research project on this during college as part of my military science courses. Um, so I, I, I reported on the battle to um, a bunch of military officials, kind of just going through the tactics that he used. Um, and really, like, besides what he couldn't have done it without, like, the courage of his men and the courage of these uh, Native American allies. Um, so 
of course, that's the first thing that you need that, that courage and that audacity to go back. Um, but you also, I think that the, the next thing that was able, enabled him to achieve victory was not the technology. Cause like you were saying, they hardly had any superior technology with them. It was the tactics and the discipline that they used, they employed. Um, cause he was able to use his men and also the, the, the warriors from the other tribes. And he was able to employ them in a way that was so organized and so efficient that he was able to take on a vastly superior force um, in, in a position of defense. And this is one of the military rules that defense is, you know, you're guaranteed to win in defense almost, especially if you have superior forces. It takes a usually like definitely you're going to need a three to one kind of superior numerical advantage to, in order to win as, on, as an offense. Um, and so they don't have the numbers, they don't have the technology, and they're taking on the Aztecs who are fighting from a defensive position. So this is extremely difficult to do. But what he does is um, basically a four pronged attack on Tenochtitlan, coming from the different villages who are the causeways that connect the mainland to Tenochtitlan, the uh, center of Mexico City. Um, so he has his men in Iztapalapa and the different uh, parts of to what is today different neighborhoods of Mexico City. And it was really fascinating when I've gone to Mexico City to be in these different areas and be like, hey, yeah, this is where Cortez like launched his attack from and he had these people here. Um, first he, you know, cuts off their water supply. And then he also uses the, the warriors from Texacoco to come across the lake. And so kind of he's hitting them from all sides and they use kind of an incremental approach to go further and further into the city. Um, ultimately, of course, they're victorious, not without a lot more bloodshed and a lot more hard fighting on both sides, but Against all odds, they do take the city. And from there, basically the, the Aztec empire is, is not able to continue and it, it crumbles without its, uh, its nucleus, its, its center. Um, and that, this brings us to an interesting point in, in history because I think that the Native American tribes uh, were, you know, they're beautiful in many ways and they have so much to offer. I'm, I'm less convinced that the Aztecs had something good to offer the world and history um, because um, I have respect for them and that they built a, an immense empire that was uh, technologically and uh, just from a building perspective, huge and impressive, but culturally, um, they were pretty messed up. <laughs> and I think that that's uh, something that's really, uh, I think almost taboo to say, but if you're thinking about who, what kind of culture leaves a better mark on, uh, history and on, uh, just people on a humanitarian perspective, there is, there's, there's not, it's not even a competition. It's better for this, for Spaniards to control Mexico than the Aztecs. What, what are your thoughts? Oh, 100%. 100%. What's gone in, right day one with Spanish rule? Human sacrifice. Christianity has the eternal sacrifice of Christ offered bloodless in the mass every day. We have no need for human sacrifice. Thus, if you're going on saving lives, lives are spared. You could probably answer, well, the Spanish brought the disease with them too. There's a difference between cutting someone's heart out and then coughing and accidentally giving someone a cold as far as human toll goes. And as far as if violence means anything to you, it's like saying there's a difference between you murdering someone or someone dying of cancer. They're both tragic, but as far as evil goes, as far as what is better for the flourishing and betterment of human society, well, it's far better for you not to be murdered. So hands down that, and then beyond that, 
we have a preservation of a culture of a way of life that we don't have should another European warlike tribe, which was coming anyway. Globalism is, you can't keep everyone from growing because if they're not growing, the culture is dying. And I think that's what you're starting to see a little bit in the Aztec empire. It's been a while since it actually grown. And that's why there's prophecies about culture, about some other culture coming and destroying theirs because they can see somewhat of the handwriting on the wall. Stagnation is, it's palpable. You can feel it and you have a sense of dread. And I think you're starting to see that somewhat in our culture now. There's those that feel the dread of the end of our culture and are pushing us to meet it faster. And those that are fighting against that saying, no, there's something here. There's life within our veins yet. And we can learn a lot from the two comparisons, from looking back at this time and then comparing it to now. So hands down, it's a good thing. It actually brings life to these cultures instead of the opposite. Yeah, I mean, it brings a lot of things which I think are inarguably, even from a... Uh, you know, of course, we do have our biases, um, but trying to remove yourself from those biases as much as possible. I think there are things that are inarguably uh, beneficial to a culture, like, you know, reading and writing on a, a uh, much more, much larger scale than what was before. Um, because part of Christianity, one of the, I think, tenets of Christianity is that the more that you... Um, uh, learn about God, the more that you can appreciate and, and know and come to know God. So it's important. I think I was always taught that like, it's important to learn more about God and be continually uh, in this uh, state of learning, um, which really was very important, it has always been important to Christianity. Christianity has always, uh, um, has always encouraged and pushed forward knowledge and the pursuit of knowledge and anything that tells you otherwise is definitely um is for one various whatever reason is misleading you because <laughs> there is uh, there is no point in history where christianity was not encouraging the pursuit of knowledge and that's that pursuit of knowledge and that desire for uh learning is one of the biggest greatest things that i think that the european culture brought to mexico because of course there was already knowledge there was already learning there you couldn't have built a, a society and culture on the scale of the aztec empire without it but the uh christianity was pushing it not just to the cultural elites but to the people to the to the common villagers someone like juan diego had been educated by missionaries right. by the franciscans because they were wanting them to know more about god and they were wanting them to have more knowledge and someone someone like juan diego in the in the prior regime during the aztec empire would not no one would have taken the time of day to educate him or to teach him anything um but it's only the missionaries and the the christians who are wanting these people to be more knowledgeable, who want them to not live in darkness. Um, and, and so just to ahead. add to that too, to add to that, Hernan Cortez recognized that he was a precursor for that which was better that was coming. Um, what you just spoke to was, or in, it still is that missionary spirit that has brought about more good than we can possibly comprehend right now. That desire to embrace all people and share what the good news of the gospel has done for this missionary, for everyone. And then along the way that, that encompasses all, everything, like learning, health, the, just the betterment of, of the human person in total. So when Hernan Cortez 
completed that, that victory, this massive victory, which brought the Aztec empire to its knees, the fir- it just so happened that on that day, the first Franciscan missionaries were coming. And so the victorious general who's just done the impossible to show who these better men were that were coming still in his battle armor goes on his knees in front of these dusty Franciscan missionaries who are the ones that are going to build this great culture really, which shows all the, all the Indian allies who these Franciscans were pretty cool little point. Hmm. Yeah. And that again, this kind of proves the, the, uh, authentic, um, uh, authenticity. I, I can't even talk. Just the, how, uh, authenticity. the, um, how seriously they took it, right? How seriously these Spaniards took their fate and took their Catholicism. And again, like we can't, um, we are, are poor historians if we don't, if we refuse to acknowledge that or refuse to see it. And maybe this is a, a story that we can continue another time about how the missionaries, um, um, I think that there is so many, there's so much great storytelling to be had in, in the story of the missionaries across the Americas, in Mexico, um, with the Franciscans who came over um, and uh, with Antonio Marhill and, and Texas and the, the missionaries of California and uh, the priests uh, also in Canada, as far as Canada with uh, St. Isaac Yohez. The Jesuits. Um, the Jesuits in Canada and then the Dominicans in Peru and um, with like uh, San Martin de Porres and all of these different, uh, these, these people who sacrificed and get, laid down their lives and who have fascinating stories. They're not boring by any uh, stretch or any means. Who, um, these are some great stories we'll have to tell Absolutely. someday. Absolutely. Let's talk about it. But while we're still having this conversation, like we will have that conversation later. I'd love to get your thoughts on the final, a final, a final point. We stand now upon stolen land. And the colonists, no matter how good at fighting they were, had no right to steal it. And we must be forever remarking and praying to the Native Americans for their, their forgiveness for the stolen land. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, this is an interesting uh, topic that you bring up this is a, a what is there a question here or is this a statement <laughs> or, well, i just want to I, I want you to tell me that i'm wrong well um this i i've you know this is a, a topic that i've thought a lot about um and i think that it is it is true that um this there that this land that we that we inhabit you know inhabit now was not it was not empty and it was not uh, a, un, uh left without a people um but i i do think we definitely oftentimes can exaggerate the the scale on which uh these people inhabited the land because the especially north america was very uh sparsely populated i mean the no, most northern uh civilizations that existed on a large scale was the Aztec empire. The other ones were much more nomadic kind of tribes that inhabited uh, what is today the United States. Um, and like I was saying earlier, there's uh, a movement, especially uh, in the United States and in Mexico to have this self-loathing for the Western half of our heritage. And I definitely think that that is a misplaced um, loathing. Um, because of all the things that we just said earlier of the, the wonderful things that Western, uh, uh, culture brought, uh, the chief among them being Christianity and that pursuit of knowledge and that, that love of knowledge, that love of learning, uh, that love of, uh, the idea of self betterment and the betterment of society. Um, you cannot argue in any way, shape or form that the Aztec empire was 
uh, concerned with the, the self-betterment of society. They were concerned with one thing and one thing only, and I think that that was their own power. Um, I, I don't, you can't convince me otherwise. I mean, like, we, we could have a discussion, but by all um, not facts that we have about them, they weren't concerned about their people. They weren't concerned about the various tribes that were part of their, their empire. Um, and so it is true that uh, Cortez came and he conquered a nation. He conquered a people that was there before him. But in his case, he definitely improved his conquer, conquering brought about an improvement for the lives of the people. Um, so you can call that stolen land if you like. Um, and from a certain perspective, it is. But still, uh, I think that this was something that was beneficial to society. Um, you know, and so there's no, I don't think, in my mind, there's no like a uh, broad stroke answer to all the different uh, tribes and all the different cultures throughout the Americas uh, because they're very different. Uh, you know, of course, the, the British, like we were saying earlier, are very different from the Spanish in their approach to colonization. I would say that the, the Spaniards were much uh, superior in their approach uh, because you have something uh, created called me <laughs> and who's a fusion of the Spanish and Native American cultures. Um, and so I, I think that that's a beautiful thing, this new flowering of people. You are a and, beautiful thing, Peter. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but it's, it's a flowering of a different, of a new people that wouldn't have existed without it. Um, and so like I'm saying, like, you can call it stolen land if you want. And definitely, definitely in the case of the United States, there are things that uh, the United States did which are unforgivable in my mind. And we should, as moral and people, especially if we call ourselves Christians, should be ashamed of that um, because it, it, is, it is terrible that, that that was done. But also... Um, we are, we are meant to learn from the past, I believe. We're not meant to be stuck in it. Um, so as, as we like teach our children about what has happened in the past, I definitely don't think that it's a, a prudent or wise thing to teach our children to be ashamed of, their, of who they are and where they've come from. Yeah. Um, what we should be teaching them is the honest truth about what has happened um, so that they can learn from it but be teaching them to be proud of who they are because there is always, there, there's so much, especially as Americans, to be proud of. We've done terrible things in the past and we don't have to hide it in order for our children to be proud of who they are and where they've come from. Yeah. Um, so that's how I see it. Yeah. Well, I completely, I completely want to affirm what you just said. I think that there is incredible beauty in this fusion that's been created and that we should recognize when our Western forebears have done evil and own up to it. However, there's two things that I would say, and we can probably, I know we're going long, so I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet after these two. I remember sitting down in History 101 back at the good old Sam Houston State University, holler, 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 uh, before transferring to the University of Texas. They had a great history department there at Sam Houston State. Love it. Uh, I think all my history professors are gone now from there, but History 101, our great professor, I won't say her name because people might not like this. She says, history has shown us one rule about whether or not a culture has a right to the land. And that rule is, does the culture have the ability to defend it? And if they don't, then they don't have a right to it. It's just the harsh fact of history. We don't have a right to Texas unless the United States and the Texans that inhabited Texas can hold it from maybe the Chinese or the Russians or whoever our enemy is at this point in time. We don't have a right to it unless we can defend it. 
It's a fact of history. And if you don't like it, suppose you don't accept this fact of history and you want to recount how this land is stolen, you're going to have to be specific because the Aztecs stole it from someone else. So if, we are land, if we're on stolen ground right now, go all the way back, please, because what right do the people that stole it from the tribe that had it beforehand have to it that we don't have? Because that's important. If you, you need to be consistent here. And if you're making new rules, please pray tell, enumerate them clearly. And there's no answer to that because you can't keep going back. We don't have a way to understand the full back to the stone, stone age of who actually sure. lived here and who stole it from who. It gets, we bogged down in the details. So in the light of that, we make what we can with history and we have a right to this land because we can defend it. And God pray we're able to keep defending it. But that's my take on stolen land arguments. <laughs> well, I, I, I think I agree with you right there. I mean, um, that kind of that brings it back to like um, what you teach your children, right? You can teach them what has happened, um, but also acknowledge that this, okay, let's say this land was stolen. This land... Um, it belongs to these people, right? And let's say, you know, teaching your child what has happened in the past, they were not, you know, this is their heritage maybe, but they, they are not the people who are doing this, right? So I, I never think that you should be teaching your child to, to loathe their own, their self because of something that their ancestors did. You need, I think it's important for a child to be taught um, self respect right the respect for um yourself as a human person and and to not take on the sins of your ancestors um and so the united states is um has done terrible things and it's done wonderful things and overall i would say it's been a it's a great force for good and something worth defending especially texas <laughs> uh, and so that's um, let's, let's defend it. Let's be able to, to not roll over at the first sign of trouble and have a bit of the, uh, the spirit of our, our Spanish, uh, forebears and to, to be able to, to take a fight and to, to have the audacity and the bravery and the courage to, to stand against what we see as, as evil, to stand against evil and to stand for, um, our, our land and for our, our families and our culture. Salud. Salud. All right. Well, thank you for joining us, everyone. This has been a, a fun conversation. Always love talking about history, especially the history of our own people and our own lands. Um, until next time, we are the Pinedo Brothers, the Catholic filmmakers. We're working to revitalize the world of Catholic art. I hope you enjoyed this podcast and we hope you'll be joining us next time. But until then, we'll see you later. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Pinedo Brothers Podcast, an artist podcast for Catholics. We hope you enjoyed it. And if so, please consider like, subscribing, and commenting below. That really helps. This episode was edited and recorded by me, JP. Makeup was done by no one, if you couldn't tell. The Pinedo Brothers are Catholic filmmaking brothers working to revitalize the world of Catholic art through film. For more information on us, check us out at PanitaBrothers.com. Thanks again.